pleasure to be just standing before you again this morning. And certainly our prayers will be offered for our beloved brother, David Brown, his recovery. If you would like to be following along with us this morning, we'll be in Matthew chapter 25. We're not going to read it just yet, but we will be reading shortly the first 13 verses of that chapter. Those 13 verses contain what we would normally refer to as the parable of the ten virgins. Before we do read that, we're going to consider a little bit of the background leading up to this parable. So this parable... This is the week prior to the crucifixion of our Savior. We see in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 and 30, through 39, that he will leave the temple for the last time. Shortly after that, that event, in Matthew 24, verse 2, he foretells the destruction of that temple. Now he and his disciples would be on Mount Olives, and they asked him, Two questions. When will the temple be destroyed? And when will the world be destroyed? And one by one, he answers these questions. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 34. And then the destruction of the world, Matthew 24, verses 35 through 51. As Jesus often did, he, he spoke in parables to help illustrate a point he was trying to get across to them. In so doing... He used three parables to further illustrate the destruction of the world. We see in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, the ten virgins. We see verses 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. And in verses 31 through 46, the sheep and the goats. Now, regarding the parable itself the one which we'll be studying this morning, the parable of the ten virgins, we see that the ten virgins, with these are what we would regard as bridesmaids, these bridesmaids were to remain alert. Their lamps were to remain lit. It must be noted that oftentimes the bride and the groom would tarry a little bit longer than expected. Perhaps the bride or the groom actually liked his in-laws. That, that does happen. Now, if the virgins were to go to sleep, these bridesmaids, and they did not have enough oil, or they were not simply present at the time that the bride and the groom came by, these bridesmaids would unfortunately miss out on the festivities that would be happening shortly after that. And obviously, this would be a great embarrassment to them. Now, on pages 63 and 67 of the book, Manners and Customs of the Bible, you'll find this about weddings during this time. It says, The wedding involved dressing up. The bride literally adorned like a queen. She was bathed, and her hair braided with as many precious stones as the family possessed or could borrow. The girls who had dressed her accompanied her as companions. The bridegroom, too, was dressed in in finery, and jewelry, and was accompanied by the friend of the bridegroom. The dressing up for the wedding was so important that it was unforgettable. The bride and groom looked like and acted like a king and queen. Another important element of the wedding was the procession at the end of the day. The bridegroom set out from his home to fetch his bride from her parents' home. A procession then set out from the bride's home to the couple's new home and the dark roadway would be lit with oil lamps held by wedding guests. In the parable told by Jesus, the bride and groom were later than expected, so the oil in the lamps began to run low. Only those who had brought a reserve flask of oil were able to refill their lamps and welcome the bride and groom. There was singing and music along the way. So obviously not much has changed in our tradition of weddings. 
Now, we didn't have oil lamps, but you normally have some type of candle. You have, I know we had LEDs down the aisle. It's a very pretty event. It's quite interesting that Jesus would choose this parable at this time and discussing these things with his disciples, his apostles. Now to the parable. Again, that's Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, which reads, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. Go ye therefore to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now we're going to, we're going to discuss each of these different aspects of this parable to hopefully glean from God's word an application that would help each of us in our Christian walk. First, we consider these virgins, the bridesmaids. They represent Christians, those that are occupying the kingdom, members of the Lord's church. We would like to point out that these members, Christians, were once sinners. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Now, when the gospel is preached to sinners, there are one of two responses. Either rejection occurs, they reject the gospel that they've just heard, or there's an acceptance to varying degrees. Ultimately, they follow that plan of salvation, as we've seen in Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. There you have the account of Philip and the eunuch. The eunuch was on his way studying what he had as his Bible, and Philip came and helped him. He started at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So preaching Jesus involves preaching about baptism, as we will later see in verses 38 and 39 of that account. For that eunuch asked to be baptized. He later was baptized, and he went on his way rejoicing. <clears throat> that eunuch as well as every other person that obeys the gospel and is baptized, undergoes what we call, what the scriptures call, the new birth. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. We today must also be born again. Upon doing so, we become a pure new creature. We see this in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And Galatians 6, verse 17. We become pure just as those virgins were. Secondly, the lamps that these bridesmaids or virgins held represent the faith of each Christian. Now we know that from reading this parable that each of these bridesmaids, each of these virgins, had a specific job to do. And that was to light the path. We ourselves today, Christians, are expected not only to gain our faith, to grow it, Romans 10, 17, but we're expected to continue to grow it. Luke chapter 17, verse 5, John 8, 24. That's not something that just ceases once we become a Christian, once we are baptized. It, it's a process that must continue until the day that we die. <clears throat> this faith is what we are to walk by. It's our standard. It's our code of conduct. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 25. God's word is what lights our path, and it has always lit the paths of men if we are, or if we are but to follow it. Psalm chapter 119, 105, as was prayed for earlier. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It does not say the Koran is a lamp unto my feet or the Catholic Catechism or any other man-made doctrine that you want to put in that place. It says thy word. God's word is a lamp unto our feet and it lights our path. As Christians, not only are we supposed to light our own paths, but it's our obligation to light the path for others. We guide them ultimately to Christ. We point the way using God's word. Now the extra oil that is referenced here represents the good works that are by faith. The good works. Now in order to perform the task, the job of guiding, these virgins, these bridesmaids, needed enough oil to get them through the night. Not just starting, but all the way through the wedding festivities. Well, we started in verse 1 of chapter 25, and then we look at verse 11. That's just 11 verses from the point of starting out and going to the wedding feast, these festivities. So that we don't have necessarily a timeline. Other than in verse 6, it says midnight. Now, I don't know when they started their wedding activities. Either way, you're talking about midnight. It's as dark as could be in this area. Maybe they had to wait five hours. Maybe they had to wait longer than that. Either way, they had to have enough oil. They had to be prepared in order to do their job. We see in verse 5 that the bridegroom tarried. This leads us to believe that this is the Christian dispensation. The bridegroom is tarrying. This is the time frame that we ourselves today are living under. Our time to carry out our good works is under this, 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 this dispensation. We won't have the ability, we never will have the ability to use our good works under the law of Moses. That law was nailed, nailed to the cross. We have to deal in our present time. It's the only way we're able to show forth our good works. <clears throat> These good works that are performed show a living faith. We see this in James chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. Galatians 5, verse 22, we see the fruit of the Spirit. We would like to point out that several different things are listed there, different attributes, but they're all labeled as a singular fruit of the Spirit. So you either are fruitful or you are not. If you are lacking in one of those areas, you are not fruitful, according to that passage. And also Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, which reads, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Well, how do we go about proving these things? By the works that we, we show forth. Now, one thing we must be particularly mindful of and careful of is that our works, our fruit, will be, not might be, but will be known by others. Matthew chapter 7, verse, verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 4. Now fourth, the coming of the bridegroom represents Christ's second coming. Jesus uses this parable to proclaim the necessity of preparedness for his return. Remember the questions that his disciples put to him. When will the temple be destroyed? When will the world be destroyed? He answered those questions. Now he's going further in depth to explain to them and to prepare them for this concept, for the actual event itself. 
Now, we must always be prepared, just like the, the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. If you're not, and you're not ready, you will suffer the same fate as these five foolish virgins. So we must be prepared because heaven is not guaranteed due to our name being on a roll sheet. Now, obviously, we're going to explain a little bit more about what we mean by that. But typically, in the mind of those that would consider themselves Christians, there are two roll sheets, two directories that they put stock in. The church directory, their local congregation, that little book where it shows maybe the, the pictures of their families, of that congregation, their phone numbers, how, which way to contact them, their address. Many folks put stock in that directory. The second directory is the Lamb's Book of Life. Now obviously we must, we should be putting stock in that second one, the Lamb's Book of Life. Is our name written in that book? If not, we need to get it written there. The only way to get it written in that book is through faithful obedience to the Word of God. So those who put stock in the church directory, we can see this idea in the parable of the sower. Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 through 23. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. As well as Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. We consider the wayside soil. We see the stony ground. We see the ground with thorns. And then we see the good ground. Out of these four soils, only one was acceptable. These three that were not acceptable were lost. The wayside, the stony, and the, the thorn-covered ground. Only the good soil, only those good and honest hearts, had the ability through their actions and their attitude to be saved by this word of God. Then we see the parable of the talents as referenced earlier, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. We have the five-talent man, the two-talent man, and the one-talent man. Now out of these three, one was lost. Then we come to the parable of the virgins. There were ten total, there were five wise and five foolish. Five of them were lost. We should note that the five virgins that were lost were not guilty of any wrongdoing per se. They were not guilty of being mean. They were not guilty of being unconcerned. They were not guilty of various things that we ourselves might consider sins today through the word of God, which rightfully would be. But we see that they were in fact guilty of being unprepared and having no foresight. That's what they were guilty of. Most of us today will not consider these large issues. Jesus did. God does. It's been asked about, or I guess stated to some that you and the Church of Christ believe you're all going to be saved. Well, the proper response to that would be, well, many of us won't even go to heaven either. Well, just because you're in the church does not mean you will be saved. You have, through your own choice, the ability to go to hell. And many, unfortunately, have chosen that rather than obeying Christ. Only those who are prepared, only those who have their name written in the Lamb's book of life, will occupy heaven when this life in the flesh is over. Philippians chapter 4 verse 3, Revelation chapter 3 verse 5, as well as chapter 21 verse 27. So we must be prepared, for we know not the hour which the bridegroom, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, will return and we will meet him in the clouds. Third, we must be prepared because no one, no one can do this for us. We see that the five foolish virgins sought 
extra oil because they didn't bring enough in the beginning. And then we see the five wise virgins, they did bring enough oil. Well, these five foolish virgins, they requested, share with us your oil. But then we see their response. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. We see that the oil is not transferable. The five foolish virgins needed to bring their own oil, but they chose not to. For us today, we must understand, must note, must realize that character, obedience, and good works are non-transferable. I cannot live my life through someone else's good, good labor, good works, though many do try. We're given in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 4 through 32, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. An individual account will be made, not a group. We don't elect a person to, to live righteously and while others can act as heathens. It's kind of like picking a designated driver for those that like to go out drinking. They all like to engage in debauchery, but while that designated driver, all they get to partake in that night is water. At the end of the night, that designated driver drives all of them home. Well, those drunkards, those sinners, those heathens are using that designated driver as a way to get home safely. I dare say that there are many Christians, many people who would wear that name, but not act as so, are doing that today. They might outwardly profess Christ, but inwardly, they're just as wicked as the world around them. They might take the attitude, the idea that my wife will get me to heaven, or my husband will get me to heaven, or my best pal so-and-so will get me to heaven because they have enough good works to go around. That's not how God sees it in light of the four verses that we just referenced. Each of those accounts reference an individual responsibility that each of us will give an account to God for the deeds that we have done in the flesh. Just as each of these ten bridesmaids, each of these ten virgins gave an account for their level of preparedness. Five of them that were wise, they were blessed. The five foolish, they were told, that I know you not. With this in mind, we must be prepared. This is done outwardly by having our lamps. Obedience is a form of outward profession and showing that we are indeed prepared. The Christian is a servant of righteousness. Romans chapter 6, verses 17 through 18. Part of being a, a faithful child of God is Worshiping God in spirit and in truth, as we are this morning. No doubt there are many people who would prefer to stay home, prefer to be out in the lake. I don't know if you'd want to do that today since it's just cool. But take your pick. There are many things in the mind of those who would not have God as their top priority that would rather be doing other things right now. Well, maybe they're hurting because they you know, worked in the garden over the weekend. I have a task to do at home. I'm not going to exercise any foresight, keeping in mind that once I do this task, I will be unable to go to worship on Sunday morning as commanded by God himself. They don't have that type of foresight. Now, that's not saying they cannot use foresight. They just choose not to. They might legitimately be in pain. They might be legitimately dealing with some type of issue that we normally deal with as humans. But were you prepared enough to think about maybe I should just wait? The garden's not going to go anywhere. And if it does, it'll grow back. We might go to some kind of ball game. This is Texas. Football is, has been stated before, somewhat of a religion. Everybody likes watching some type of football game. Whether we consider it soccer or actual American football. 
Do we put that ahead of, of serving God through worship? Most people do. In fact, you can go survey the country right now. There's going to be several folks that are getting ready for the Texans football game right now. If they have it, I don't know. I don't keep up with the NFL. But there's some type of ball game going on. And many folks would rather do worldly things, engage in those worldly activities that might not be sin of themselves, but they're going to devote their time, their efforts to go to that event, and then they're going to come back hurting financially. Oh, maybe I spent too much at concession stand and I can't give a portion of my goods back to God. That's a problem. Do we put God first? Now, as we stated, having obedience, having a living faith, there is an outward profession of that. And we, that is done by having our lamps, and not just the lamp itself, but having it lit. There is plenty of oil to, to be used. To have faith without obedience is like having a lamp with no oil. Just like James had stated earlier that so the body without the spirit is dead, so a faith without works is dead also. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 5 through 9 says this, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these, th if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that ye shall never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. Now this morning I put in some contacts, some new ones because my old pair were wearing out. Without those contacts, without my glasses... I'm just about blind. That's not the same blind that Peter is referring to. We're talking about spiritually blind. Cannot see afar off. That deals with foresight. What I'm doing today is going to have consequences tomorrow. Good or bad. And the, the final phrase of that verse, And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Have we forgotten that we've been purged, that we've been purified, and that we've been added to the Lord's army? I dare say many have. Many Christians have allowed their lamps to go out. In the day of judgment, what excuse will we offer to our righteous judge if that indeed has occurred? What will you say to your Lord as He judges you? And you're not prepared. Next, we must be prepared because of the second coming of Christ. We know that Jesus will return. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. We can know this. We can read about it in the Bible. God's word tells us so. Christ will return. His second coming will reveal our true character. In the parable of the ten virgins, we see that all ten of these bridesmaids appeared the same. They all appeared to be faithful. Part of that being the fact that they were chosen to be these these ten bridesmaids. They were chosen by the bride, the bride to fulfill this obligation of carrying those lamps and lighting the way. So you have to meet certain qualifications to do that. We as Christians had to follow those qualifications in order to become a Christian. Following the plan of salvation as we normally call it. Now in the parable... As we've said, these ten virgins appeared all the same. But what changed? Well, when the bridegroom came, it was revealed that five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. 
When Christ returns, he will reveal hypocrites. Romans chapter 2, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. Are there hypocrites in the church? Absolutely. Where else would they be? That is usually a, a deterrent of folks that might want to obey the gospel or using an excuse not to remain faithful. Ah, well, there's, there's hypocrites in the church. Of course there is. Would you expect to find a hypocrite as an atheist? A Christian that's not living up to the, the name he's been given? You know, living out a certain, or at least teaching a certain way, but not living up to it? Would you expect, you know, pick any denomination today. Are there really any hypocrites in each of those bodies? No. They're not living by God's standard. They're not washed in His, they're not washed in Christ's blood. Now that's not saying they can't be, but until they do, they're lost. And to the individual that claims to be a child of God but does not live righteously, they're in the same boat as those in the denominations. They're lost and undone. Now this, just because there are hypocrites in the church, is not a valid excuse as to why we should not serve God. As we referenced earlier, each of us are going to have to give an account to God for our sins, for our Righteousness for our good in this life. Now, thankfully, we have an advocate, and that's Jesus. Now, everyone has sin, but it's the blood of Christ that covers that sin. If you've not availed yourself to that blood, then you don't have that benefit. You don't have that mediator when this judgment is to come. Now, the second coming of Christ marks the end of opportunity to change. There is no second chance at that point. These five foolish virgins attempted to enter the wedding. We see in, in verse 11 of Matthew 25. They were prepared at that point. But you see the bridegroom had already come. And the door was shut. There was no way for them to enter the wedding festivities at that point. They received their answer. I know you not. Now it must be, it must have taken a considerable amount of effort for each of these virgins in this parable to dress for the wedding feast. When you consider the pictures that have, I guess, been, been uh, offered through time of the, the many precious jewels that have been braided into these brides' hair, it's a, quite a pretty sight. The lengths that they've gone to to make sure that she did look like a queen also for the, the groom to make him look like a king. And then you consider the amount of effort it would be to not only carry the lamps throughout the night, but to also take enough oil to make sure that you were able to do your job. You think that oil was light? Then you had to hold these lamps. You had to be prepared. But for each of these bridesmaids, through all that work, all that effort, don't you think that that, that, wedding festi that wedding festival was worth all their troubles? Of course it was. They got to be present. They got to partake in all those different festivities. At least five of these maids did. Five of them were not allowed to because they were not prepared. Today it takes just as much, if not more, effort to be a Christian. To put into practice those things that we can read about and study in God's word. We must stand for the truth of that word. We can't allow error in, whether it be the, the congregation itself or an individual level. We cannot allow error in. We have to continue to grow our faith through faithful study of God's word. We have to perform these works of obedience. Yet when Christ returns to call those that have been righteous in this life to to call those that have been obedient to his will and they inhabit heaven for all eternity, don't you think it will be worth it then? Absolutely. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and tw uh, through 32, we see that the, the church is, is likened to a bride. And Christ is the bridegroom. He will come back to claim his bride. Revelation tw chapter 21, verse 2 and verses 9 through 27. He is coming back to claim his bride. Just as we can read about in the, the, par the, tar the parable of the ten virgins, the bridegroom tarried. Christ is tarrying, thankfully, for us. You know, we, I pray, are granted long enough lives to correct the wrongdoing that each of us have done. <clears throat> but he will return. Now, each of us will receive one of three answers in that, Lord, that last day, this day of judgment. For the child that fell away will receive the same answer that these foolish virgins received. I know you not. Matthew chapter 25 verse 12. For the one who never obeyed the gospel. Matthew chapter 7 verse 23. I never knew you. <clears throat> For the child that endured. Matthew chapter 25 verse 21 and 23. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. <clears throat> now which do you want to hear on the, on the judgment day? I know which one I want to hear. Well done. Now wanting to hear something such as well done is a far cry different from being able to. Are you living accordingly to receive such an answer? If you are not a child of God, obey the word of God. Follow that plan of salvation. Ultimately be baptized for the remission of your sins. Put on Christ in baptism. And at that point you are, as the parable stated, one of those virgins. But it doesn't end there. You must be prepared in every moment of your life. For the child of God who has stumbled, repentance and prayer will remove that sin and will restore you to a properly functioning relationship with your God. If either of these needs needs to be met this morning, please take the time as together we stand and sing.